Okay, our next realm is the South Asian realm. Let me advance just a bit first to give you some context. So we've covered um, most recently the areas of Africa and Southwest Asia. And Afghanistan's kind of a leaner, it can kind of go either way, but we're gonna include it with South Asia, but we're kind of working our way East now from the Middle East into South Asia. And then next we'll be covering East Asia. So South Asia, the big country here is India. This is kind of a monocentric realm, you know, where there's a big dominant country because India is the second largest, most populated country in the world and, and soon to be the most populated country in the world. And nearby we have Pakistan and Bangladesh, which are also relatively large, have large populations. We'll talk a little bit about why that is. And then there's a few other um, countries like Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and a few, Bhutan and Nepal, and the Maldives, which are kind of hard to see, but they're a set of islands out in the ocean. We'll talk about those separately. But India is going to take probably a disproportionate amount of focus in this chapter. Uh, make sure you, under, you know the concepts, ideas, and terms as usual. I didn't highlight any here, but a number of these that we'll be going over in lecture, but um, even if we don't, the ones that we don't cover in lecture, please make sure you understand them. They're highlighted in the chapter when you do your reading. In fact, the new book has, this is from the last version of the book. The new book's uh, list is a bit longer than this. Okay, so population. India is the second most populated country in the world, second only to China. And these are some graphs from uh, Google search. I just updated them. And if you look at India here in blue, when you look at China there, um, you can kind of see what's happening, that India is growing at a faster rate than China is in terms of population. So eventually it will surpass China and be the most populated country in the world. Um, they're pretty close to each other. They both, they are the two countries in the world that have over a billion people, it's like 1.3, 1.4 billion people thereabouts. And it kind of overshadows Pakistan, but Pakistan too is a relatively, has a relatively large population, over 200 million people, larger than, so, you know, so we can compare it to, you know, you know, it's almost not quite the United States size, but it's approaching them. And Bangladesh here um, has over 100, you know, in the high 100 millions too. So um, fairly large populations here, especially compared to Southwest Asia or the Middle East, where the countries were about 100 million people or less. All right, we've talked about plate tectonics before. And I want to highlight a little bit of the physical geography. So this is uh, India, and it's on its kind of its own tectonic plate called the Indian plate. And if you see that arrow, it means that it's kind of pushing upward. Sometimes they call it the Indian subcontinent because it's almost like its own little piece of landmass that's pushing in to the larger Eurasian. And I'll include a uh, part of a film that kind of shows us in more detail. So, um, and, and watch the video that I include part of a film that kind of shows this a little bit more graphically, but What's happened, we've talked about continental drift, that the continents, we had Pangaea that broke up and, then, and the pieces and the continents have moved around over time. So with the break of, of Pangaea, the India landmass was separate. And as it moved northward over time, it kind of crashed into the Eurasian um, tectonic plate or the Eurasian continent and got welded together with it. And that process is what created a big, the biggest mountains in the world called the Himalayas, right? So this is kind of India over time, kind of moving northward. Um, there's a sea called the Tethys Sea that used to be in between it and the Eurasian landmass. But as it crashed into the continent, it kind of folded up that ocean to where there's actual ocean sediments that are embedded in the Himalayan mountains because they were kind of crunched up during this process. And uh, one other detail as well, 
that at one time when India was kind of make, migrating its way towards the Eurasian landmass, it sat over a what's called the geologic hotspot. That's kind of thing that's underneath Hawaii or Yellowstone National Park where there's a bunch of lava underneath. And that caused a whole bunch of volcanoes that kind of built up the Indian landmass and made a big kind of a, a, a kind of added layer and layer of volcanic material of it over it on its as it made its way on, on its journey northward. All right, so that, that those layers of volcanic material created something called the Deccan Plateau. The Deccan Plateau is the southern part of India. And so this is kind of a, it's not super mountainous, but it's sort of a higher elevation area. And then the biggest mountains in the world are up here, the Himalayas. And there's also, I mentioned the Hindu Kush mountains, which kind of are kind of at a perpendicular angle to the Himalayas that run through Afghanistan. So this is a large volcanic plateau. These are the Himalayas, largest mountains on earth, kind of at the, the, the boundary between India and China back here. And then we have the Hindu Kush mountains that extend down into Afghanistan. So Afghanistan isn't as populated because it's more mountainous and remote, and remote because of the Hindu Kush mountains. And between these mountains, we have uh, river lowlands or river valleys essentially. And there's three primary ones. There's the Indus River Valley. Now the Indus, even though that it's the same name like India, however, in the modern geography, you know, in the way the countries are now, the Indus River is in Pakistan. And the Indus River is the primary river valley where there's a large population of people in Pakistan. Over in India, the big one is the Ganges River. And the Ganges River sits between two features, between the Deccan Plateau and the Himalayas. So you have high elevation here, kind of high elevation there, and then a big river valley in between. Then lastly, we have the Ganges Delta, which is part, um, Bangladesh is primarily in the Ganges Delta, part of India is as well. But most of, just about all of Bangladesh sits on the Ganges Delta here. This is where rivers come together and make and kind of spill out into the ocean. So make sure you understand these three, you know, these some of these main physical features, like the Indus being in Pakistan, the Ganges being between the Deccan Plateau and the Himalayas, and the Ganges Delta being the area of Bangladesh. So this is from a different textbook showing population density, but I want to highlight this. You see this big strip of population from the Ganges Delta to the Ganges River, and then down the Indus River. These river valleys are where you have a very densely populated parts of these countries. This is where you have a high density of people that make up these big populations. And what we'll see in the future is that's kind of true of China too. These, it, these are river valleys in China where you have uh, fertile soils, water resources, agriculture, high populations. So if this is showing population density in the world. You can see two big centers of population are the river valleys of India and Pakistan, and also the river valleys of China. You see all that red there. Now, one side effect of the Himalayas is that it helps to create a seasonal rain pattern called the, the Asian monsoon. Now, it, it's actually more than just the Himalayas, but the Himalayas help to intensify this. But let me just kind of jump ahead to a figure here. So the Asian monsoon, let me blow this up a little bit, is a year-long pattern where you have a dry winter, air is blowing from the land out into the ocean because it is colder, but in the summer, the land is hotter. And so it's kind of sucking the air in from the ocean and you get an intense amount of rainfall. So the land in the winter is relatively dry, but in the summer is relatively wet. So these monsoons are incredibly important in both South Asia and East Asia. They're caused because 
in the summertime, you have what's called low pressure air is moving upward. It's heated, moving upward, the land is hotter than the ocean is. So it's drawing in air from the ocean. And so in the summer is when they have their wet weather. That's the opposite from what we have in our Mediterranean climate in California. But so in them, with them, summer is the wet season. And the opposite, it reverses itself during the winter time. You have air kind of, it's cold, the air is moving downward and pushing out, creating dry conditions. Here's another figure showing the pattern of these different monsoons. You have the, the in South Asia, they kind of come in this, you know, kind of come in from the Indian Ocean and then reverse themselves in the winter. And one thing, and we'll just, since we'll just include East Asia as well for the future, you have a little bit of a, of a later pattern where, you know, it happens a little bit later in the season where a monsoon comes up into, into East Asia and then reverses itself in the winter time. These are from my physical geography class. It's called a climograph, a graph showing rainfall patterns. And these are in a couple of places that have a monsoon pattern. And so what you have is pretty low rainfall in the wintertime and then a big burst, just amazing amount of rainfall in the summer. That's why these bars are so high. They're actually off the charts in terms of rainfall. 